We are here with Jared Kligerman, former VP of Business uh, Development and Operations here at WITS that you and I hung out for many years together. Now, president of super successful, the Think Tank Marketing Company, and new dad to one-year-old Sophie. Welcome, Jared. Super glad to be here with you. Awesome to be back with you. All right, so we're going to have a conversation today. We've just been warming up and we've been chatting about a lot of things. We've been chatting about sales, networking. We've been chatting a little bit about technology, uh, parenting. Uh, we were talking about the difference between directorship versus, you know, um, more authoritative styles. Uh, authoritative styles, yes. exactly. So, you know, really what we want to talk about a little bit today, I think we all go all over the place, but communication came up with all the things we were talking about. So, this title today, the role of communication skills or the role of effective communication and successful business. Yeah. That without one, we don't have the other. So, you were recently at Elevate and Collision Conferences. And we were chatting about that. And you mentioned something interesting where you said, like, with these conferences that are so big, you know, really picking your path and knowing what your experience is going to, or knowing what you want to get out of the experience is important. So, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. It's. You know, these bigger conferences are amazing in that they bring in global talent that you're never going to have access to otherwise, as well as some of those real thought leaders who are on cutting edge or even talking futuristic type of topics. The challenge is, is that there's just so much to see. I mean, these are multi-day conferences with multiple stages in the case of collision multiple event spaces in terms of elevates so let's start with collision so sure. tell me a little bit about collision like in regard to the speakers there or maybe why you went there in the beginning yeah so collision is north america's if not the world's largest startup tech innovation conference is kind of the best way to think about it it moved to toronto for the first time last year it's coming back in 2020 uh, i ended up going to it because i helped vote it into toronto it was a linkedin post type of thing what do you mean you help? Oh, you helped. Oh, you were yeah, like yeah, sort yeah. of participating so from the beginning. Being all tech and startup yeah, yeah, yeah. oriented. They said, you know, where should we go next? We've been based out of San Fran and the traditional place you expect this type of conference to be. Where should we go? So LA was in the running, New York, and obviously Toronto. Toronto won because Toronto's awesome. Um, so we came here for the first time. And so this conference is really geared towards innovation and startups. So you have hundreds of different startups, all of whom have booths there for a single day. Okay. So this conference is really geared towards those startups and people who are trying to better the world, make better human beings, better companies, better products. Are they making better human beings? Some are. Some are doing some awesome things. There's all sorts of new communication tools. We were talking a little bit before, and I'm mm. sure we'll talk about it again later, about VR and how that might play into communication. You know what? Let's jump into that now. You want to jump into that yes. now? Let's so, jump into that now. Just to preface this one. and catch the audience up, Jerry and I were chatting about uh, the work we do, which is training and how this new world of VR is kicking in. And what happens when you could take, you know, one of us here at WITS and put them on the other side of the world and give them that same interpersonal experience? Talk to us about B VR. What do you think about that? So I, I think VR is definitely something that's going to become fully integrated into what we do, as is augmented reality. And truthfully, I see a much larger future in the short term for augmented reality versus virtual reality due to the cost barrier. Um, augmented reality, if you have a cell phone these days, you have access to augmented reality both as a developer and as a user. Yeah, you so see it in a lot of retail experiences. That's the biggest place. Um, so my agency drifting into that, we specialize in shopper marketing, which is really involved in that retail space. So I'm deep into what retail is becoming because mm. we have all heard about the retail apocalypse. That's not happening. Retail is evolving and changing to a completely new beast to what we've ever thought of it before. And I think AR has a huge role in that. And I think VR does as mm -hmm. well. It's just a little bit further out than where some of those who are in the space think it's going to hit because, of course, they want to hear sooner. Yeah. Um, but as it pertains to what we do, you know, or what I used to do, what you still do, sorry, yeah. habits, right? You're, still, you're, you're, you're an alumni. You're still part uh, of the crew. Yeah, like you're you're, 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 you're officialized into oh, it. Yeah. Uh, so where is this slowly shifting for us? I mean, we looked at this. Um, I remember going back a number of years, we were looking at the technology side of what we did and we made the decision at that point that we either had to scale up, do this virtual touch point thing or sell mm -hmm. it off. And the cost of capital required to build that system out was just astronomical and it makes sense. Yeah. Fast forward into what we do now, that's also where things are heading. Does it make sense to invest in it now? Unless you've got lots of money in your pocket ready to burn, probably not. But where we're heading, and we're so close to it already, mm -hmm. is that VR is a truly immersive experience. When you're in it, you feel like you are there. Mm -hmm. 
we've all seen those videos of people in the games where they dive to get over something and they land flat on their face. Um, the best VR experiences, incidentally, actually have humans walking around you so they can catch you when you fall because they know this is going to happen. So this is this is how real it is. And so once the biggest barrier, which is cost, I think it's yeah. probably the biggest barrier right now for VR, once that cost comes down, you are now going to be able to literally have clients globally. Whereas, you know, we, back when I was here, it was only a couple of years ago, you know, we were doing calls in Europe and Asia and... You know, you have them on the phone, they might come into a global conference, you get that one-on-one -on -one interaction once as part of a collective, but mm. even in those instances, you don't get the same experience that you get when you get to come to the Wits office and sit down with Greg Wits in his office to have a one-on-one -on -one hour coaching session. Those people don't experience that. What we're heading to and we'll be able to do very, very shortly is you'll be able to put on a headset and headphones and gloves and they'll be able to do the same and you'll be able to have a fully interactive experience together in greg you can't see the quotations on the podcast quotations in greg Witz's yeah. office where you're right there and if someone blows on your face you're going to feel be really weirded out because nothing in your environment shows as a fan well so if, if that there. if you could actually get to that 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 standpoint look i think vr for back to the retail standpoint mm -hmm. you mentioned things like uh, the retail apocalypse which i agree with you everyone thought retail was going to die and it absolutely is and it's 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 evolved into this whole new experience Absolutely. like if you look at the majority of malls in fact we did recent uh, uh recent work with uh, a number of malls uh or property management companies mm -hmm. that run the malls uh and their focus is creating these experiences for their audience to come in so you as a young family come in and obviously there's all the experience for your daughter but there's also the shopping experience for you and I was recently adding something that you're involved with and we'll sort of do a shout out to them it's uh, I might butcher the, butcher the name Fuck Up Nights Toronto oh, God, I got it I got it it is Fuck Up Nights Toronto Fuck Up not not, not, not I got fucked up no, not or, or fuck you're me, fucked up Toronto, yeah. or fuck none of that Toronto, none of those so no, no, no. Fucked Up Nights Toronto, Toronto and my Toronto. mother in law you know Tony Abramson oh, was actually one of the speakers. She, she was, kicked I ass. Make that one. I was so disappointed. It's by cool. Said the teammate. It was okay. But they say they had a speaker from uh, PNG, and yes. the marketing go was talking about VR and how they butchered this project they were working on. But the idea was, a uh, consumer was going to walk into a pharmacy and go to the pain section mm -hmm. where you see Tylenol and Advil, and you would take your phone and you'd scroll over, and your phone. In fact, AR, mm -hmm. not VR, yeah, AR. AR would um, now animate. Yep. And for example, as you scrolled your phone over, it would be like, oh, this is for back pain and like a little animation of like someone with a hurting back versus someone holding their head for a migraine. Yes. And that's the way you'd be able to sort of pick your medicine. But their challenge was the actual technology that had to go into it. Right? Um, and, 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 you know, that's the biggest right now that's other than cost from the standpoint of development in VR, for AR, that's the biggest challenge is really around getting the consumer to engage with that AR experience. We all think it's very cool, but yeah. right now it's still more of a PR stunt than an actual tactic, but that's yeah. changing. Um, your, your vision of, of that type of idea of scrolling over pain meds, um, I had a very similar one coming up on the legalization of cannabis here in Canada for those retail environments where now you can just have an app where as you go over each different strain, it would be able to pull up the terpene profile and the cannabinoid okay, profile. Okay, let's but talk about that, cannabis and okay. retail. So they've just done, a, there's been a whole legalization. Oh. Edibles are now in, beverages Thanks. are now in. So the Beverages not, not yet. No, but no, no, no. They, they all are, but they're not available to the consumer until later this year. So that's now fine. all these brands can have put in their applications. So sure. are you doing any work in the cannabis in, in the, uh, you know industry? What? I tried really actively to get myself involved and then I I've really quickly backed myself back out. Why? Mostly because the rules and regulations around marketing are geared to a very specific type of marketing agency. And truthfully, we just aren't it. So um, I have some very close friends who are chief commercial officers for all sorts of amazing companies. Uh, I, I don't know if I can say them publicly, which is why I only reason I'm hesitating on saying it. Um, so he came to me and said, hey, you know, you're my buddy. I love what you do. I want you to rep us. And I said, no. And I referred him off to a friend of mine because I can help all those companies in their B2B side. So how do you sell that product to the OCS? But mm -hmm. the type of marketing required to sell that product to the consumer is much more event PR and experiential marketing. And yeah, and yeah. we do all that stuff, absolutely, yeah. but it's not, our, it's not our primary focus. It's part of what we do. So tell me about your business. Look, I, I, and, and, and let's start with this. You and I worked together for many years. Over and as entrepreneurs years. or as an entrepreneurial organization, 
uh, you've now branched off and now you're into your own entrepreneurialism yeah. and running a company and congrats and Thank amazing. You. And, um, but, you know, why, why don't we start with a little bit of like, what was maybe, what was that first experience like? In other words, you came from an entrepreneurial firm, you went out and you did it on your own. And as much as we know what we're doing, and as much as we have such experience, there's always a shock factor. What was your shock factor? Ooh. So I don't know if it was a, um, I don't know if it was a shock factor so much as me running into things I thought I wouldn't run into and going, oh, I've taught so many people and coached so many people through this and now I'm in that situation and I'm not even listening to my own advice. And worst case, my own advice isn't even helping here. It's what the hell have I told all these other people? Um, so change. Change is fucking tough, man. It is really tough. And so I came into this agency. It's been around, when I came in, it had been almost 30 years, or over 30 years now. I'm not unlike Wits, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I took it over from the founder who in his own words, and full kudos to him for recognizing this, he was a stereotypical boomer with trust issues. His own words, not mine. So um, some of the change I got to implement from the get-go was really easy. So things like putting in a proper telework and flex schedule uh, policy. Operational stuff. The operational stuff. Which is definitely. your experience and a lot of your background. Absolutely. And, and more importantly, got me immediately, immediate buy-in and camaraderie with the team because I was the guy who made their lives better which I sure hope I've continued to do over the last two years. Um, but then as, once you get the easy wins, this is where it starts getting hard. And this is where you start making more substantial strategic change. And so uh, some of which has worked really well, most of which hasn't. Um, a prime example of that is we're trying, when we first took it over, we tried to shift ourselves to be more of a sales-oriented organization because that's what we all want to be. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to get my account team to sell. Which, Tell me, what, and what does that mean when you're trying to get them to sell? Like, so what are you trying to do? my account team within my, I can't speak for the industry, so I can speak for my company. So my company within this wonderful world of marketing agencies, my account team is very focused on their existing clients and nothing else. So I was trying to shift that to say, I didn't expect them to become salespeople, but I wanted them to, using some of our Outreach. technology, I wanted them to engage their network, engage yeah. deeper. We actually have a full dedicated Slack channel called Engage Deeper. And all we do is talk about who we reached out to that day. Most active on it, me, uh, my one VP, uh, Sherry Ann, who handles all my clients, my strategy. She is my company mm -hmm. and couldn't live without her. Um, phenomenal woman, very, very smart. Um, so she does a lot. And then my account team supports where they can. Um, and not to say they don't put some effort in, they all do, but to varying mm -hmm. levels. Yeah, but you got to manage your expectations with that. Expectations with that. As much as you're trying to create sure. this sales culture that everyone's doing it. Look, it's hard, man. It's really fucking well, hard. I, we had this conversation yeah. just the other day around, you know, what's the expectation for all of us that participated with? Yes, we all want to be doing sales, but I think what you talk about the most is outreach. And this is a big conversation, Definitely. not just with um, with actual business development or sales folks, but um, people that work at the organization. And there's a conversation of culture that says people are part of this culture and they're super excited to present and create opportunities for the business. And then there is the sales culture, which is people just think this way and it's all about just hustling and grinding. And you hear people like Gary Vee who are all about hustle, 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 hustle. Yeah. And you hear every sort of uh, you know person out there online talking about being an entrepreneur and you gotta grind it, you gotta hustle it, you gotta work it, boom, boom, boom. But I have a very sort of simple thought to that, which is as long as we are disciplined in our outreach, and I talk a lot about you, particularly for more of the introverted personalities or withdrawn oh, personalities yeah, yeah, yeah. that say things like, oh, I'm not a salesperson. And the quick answer to that is no one wants to deal with a salesperson, but let's take who we are as human beings and work that outreach in our own way. And your outreach Absolutely. was, LinkedIn. Oh, my now email. Is exclusively LinkedIn. I right? Die, but yeah, and, and you know, you're a master at LinkedIn. Uh, How I many like meetings so. do we used to have just because of your outreach? And people would be like, Jared, I would describe Jared as a super high introverted personality. He's a high withdrawn child. Yes, he's social and extroverted. Yes, he's got all these other aspects. But one of the core things is that high withdrawn child. I only know this because of the assessment, right? Oh, I, I was going to say, I mean, people don't see you when you step off that stage, get out of that meeting, exactly. off the call. And I used to say that all the time when I was a speaker with us, right? I'd go out and say, hey, you know, all you introverts, especially, especially on the sales front, 
all of you, you don't see me when I walk off the stage, but I'm about to go collapse, have six coffees just to drive myself home after this, right? And people don't get that. And that was a big reminder for me as I'm trying to get these, um, my team, I have to say, let me just, in case my team listens to this, because 100% they will, I love my team. I work with phenomenal Fuck people. Fuck your team, all right? Do better, assholes. They, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't do anything without them, literally. Like, I can't do what my agency does, which will come back to you because I get to avoid what most, the biggest mistake most founders make, which means, which is they stay hands-on with their companies. Yeah. I literally cannot. It's yeah. the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, but I was trying to force my team into a sales mold. And you and I both know from having dealt with hundreds of companies around the globe that that never works. You can never force someone so far out of their comfort no. zone. And so we had to, we, when I say we, I mean I, I had to take a step back um, and also the owner to a lesser extent mm -hmm. to say, you know what, what can we actually realistically expect? And what's come of this is they don't necessarily post within our Slack channel because they don't necessarily feel like what they're doing is engaging deeper or doing stuff. But I'm connected with my entire team on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, every single team member is liking stuff. They're mm -hmm. commenting on things. They're, mm -hmm. they're engaged. Mm -hmm. That is drastically different from where we were two years ago, but it's about yeah. giving avenues and recognizing what people can and, well, not even can, but they aren't, aren't comfortable with doing yeah. and where you can push them into that discomfort and where you can't. Yeah, and I, th I a, think what I heard, I heard you say, just to sum it up, is like, you know, the book says one thing about change and strategy, but then trying to implement it, there's a human being that connects in there. Big time. And that's where it all fails. And if you're smart as a leader or as a entrepreneur or a boss or a whatever you want to call it, you're going to adjust that. And what I heard you just say right now is like the intention of being the sales driven organization hasn't shifted. That's your need. You get to run that. You're the president. You're the boss. This is who you are. Um, but you'll accommodate and support. I think support's the most important word for people to do it differently. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, bringing back to the communication piece when it comes to these big changes, um, we used to talk about this a lot as well, is understanding how change is going to impact people differently and making sure everyone's on the same page when it comes to the type of change being talked about. I'm still trying to change stuff within the agency. One of the biggest strategic change I, changes I want to implement, and we're there now, finally, was when we go to pitch on a big piece of work, we will have pre-tested some of our concepts. So when we come in, we can talk about projected results. Nobody else is doing this yet. Give me three years as we standard, but we're ahead of the curve right now. Okay, so what you're saying right now sounds like the value proposition fucking sales pitch. And I know that's not what you're trying to do. But I know what you're is. trying to do is really no, 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 present no, no. like, hey, like I'm giving. Like I know your heart and I know where you come from, but break that down. So yeah, yeah. why is that important? Like, you know, why are you doing this? Uh, you know, all the how important did, reasons. Yeah. Let me, let me share the business case because I literally have spent two years convincing my VPs to buy into this concept and they just have signed off. Awesome. Yeah. It took a long time. And part of it came down to understanding what I was looking for, but let me start with the root problem we face, which is like so many companies within their sector, we really aren't that differentiated. And you know, we used to run into this all the time. I still run into this with my agency. When you start getting into, let me use my agency, we're a shopper marketing agency. So we are collaborative. Name an agency who isn't. We're strategic. Name one who, you start going down all these differentiators. There's value props. These are all the same shit Me, 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 yeah, me. Right? I'm just, tall, I'm handsome, me, 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 me. I'll look after you, I'll love you, I'll hold you forever. 100%, but not only is it just me, 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 it's me, but I'm being echoed and replicated by all my competition. Mm -hmm. So at that point, it's on differentiator. So I've worked tirelessly for two years trying to find a way to differentiate myself. Um, Terry O'Reilly, who's a, he has a show on CBC. He was the, I guess at this point, almost grandfather of truly innovative radio advertising back in the day. Brilliant dude. He talks about this a lot, which is we just don't differentiate ourselves. So I spent two years trying to nail down what we do differently. Mm -hmm. And at the core of it, it comes down to our creative and our strategy. Neither of which I can sell. No, because, because that's what everyone like fucking bragging. says, and man. Like Every, bragging and it's any awful. market it goes, it's like a training company. Oh, why do you want to work here? Well, we have the best trainers, we've got that's the it. best content, yeah. and we got the best delivery. Right. Right? Now Fuck break off. that down for me. Yeah. Well, we, this percent so much experience yeah. and so much experience. So what? Yeah. That's Here's what I say now. Like, listen, this is this is what you get. This crazy, wild, fucking crazy team. And yeah. if you're into it, Rock and roll. Well, and, and this is where for you, that's 100% your differentiator. From us, I'm not a differentiator. God knows I'm not a differentiator. You that's are, Jared. Me. You're an absolute no, no, differentiator. I, I open doors. But when it comes to what we actually execute, I'm not involved, right? This is what separates me from every other agency out there is that me as a president, I'm not involved in our actual execution. 
at all. Okay, which at we could all. argue is a good or a bad thing. I 100%. hear you're arguing it as a good thing. Um, mostly a good thing because it means that my expertise is used where it's used best and my team's expertise is used where it's used best. Jerry, you, 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 you're, you're an MBA in marketing, bro. Uh, many things, including marketing. Okay. But an Sorry. MBA, an MBA, many things, including many things. marketing. <laughs> it specializes in strategy and org behavior too. But um, an MBA doesn't equate to experience. And no. I, I mentor so many MBA students who come out of an MBA transferring from engineering who think they're going to land a brand manager position with P&G making 80 grand plus. The salary to job position isn't incorrect. Yeah. Your MBA doesn't make up the three plus years of experience mandatory for that role. And people think it is. It's not. It will now put you in position to compete with the top of the bachelor students for that one percent. notch above that entry level. Here's what an MBA has become. And, and, and I still lecture. Uh, you know, Schulich? Yes. I'm up there all the time. I wasn't going to say the name, but, but yes, I, Schulich. I, I will because I'm an, an alumni. I'm a mentor Amazing. up there. I'm part of the Dean Society. I'll Amazing. pitch it all day. No. Now, when, maybe don't go there for your MBA. No, no, no. go there. Matter, like, it, bro, it, you came experience. out of there with your MBA. I did, but I've so I have such a challenge with this. I typically tell. Let's people not, not argue MBAs, MBAs, but let's go back to the point. Well, the point is, MBA, but, yeah. is MBAs have now turned into just an extension of school. Mm-hmm. Once upon a time, MBAs were known for you finish your MBA and you stepped into that partnership at that consulting firm, or you were guaranteed that eighty thousand dollar. And in today's world, people think it's 200,000, but you were guaranteed it because there was an, there was an uh, absence of, call it skill and entrepreneurialism in the job market. Yep. Today, we live in a world where you're getting people tooled in way more experience than academics. Now, if I could push my kids to do an MBA or a PhD, not, I shouldn't say push, but if I could if they would be interested in doing that, I would be happy to support that because I think the academics Ooh. and the education could be really good. I think you and I would not, agree on that. Not at the expense of that entrepreneurial experience. So I talk to a lot of people about their MBAs right now. And my first question is, what is your objective out of your MBA? Well, the MBAs we meet are the ones that are like, oh, I signed up because either one of two reasons. Uh, my parents expected me to. Yep. Right? I was, this was it. I was shifted, uh, right? Progression. Or, uh, oh, this is this is because I'm getting this job. Yep. Or I want to get that job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me I'm transfer get- from my existing exactly. career to something new. Exactly. And so I'm with a lot of students just before MBA or in their early stages when they can still kind of modify what they're doing. And my big question is, what's your objective in doing so? Because if you're trying to get a differentiator to stand up from the crowd. An MBA is not going to do that for you and hasn't for at least the last five years, if not even longer. What I always say is, what's the skills that you're trying to develop? Is it finance is your gap? Are you trying to pivot into finance? Then go do a master's of finance. So, it is way more valuable yeah, for you but let's, let's, any let's go here, Jared. And, and you know, I was going to introduce you as Jared Kligerman, former database entry professional at WITS, <laughs> yeah. former customer liaison, former like picker. rigor that had to like break the rooms down. You came in, you know, you were doing, fi- finishing your MBA the last year. Yeah. You worked Mondays and Fridays, which were the worst fucking days of the oh. week to hire anyone because Fridays, everyone's looking for the weekend and Mondays, everyone's depressed. But you were like, hey, my schedule, I'm in school Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah. I could work Mondays and Fridays. Yeah. And we hired you as the chief database entry architect. That sounds about right, yeah. Slash engineer. Architect skills whatsoever. That's it. Yeah. Go in and take people's names and type them into the fucking database, the yeah. CRM. That's it. And call them and qualify. Yeah. And you, I think you did that for the first six months. A little bit shy, but close. Right? Yeah. yeah. And we saw such natural talent <laughs> in you that we, we progressed you, but that is the greatest story you can tell MBAs. Let me tell you about when I left my MBA, I was making... I think at the time, 35, yep. 35,000 a year with a fucking MBA in marketing and, and let fucking me tell you, engineering. I tell that story all the time. Good, these, because that's the fucking story you should be telling. Because these MBAers, I meet them in these speed mentoring sessions. Or I go for, like, on Thursday, I'm seeing not one, not two. I'm meeting four <laughs> students on Thursday. Every single one of them has heard me talk before, and I've told every single one of them, that story to say whatever you think you're expecting at the other end this is the reality of it so when i say i recommend most people don't do an mba let me clarify that slightly Mm -hmm. 
if you need a solid business acumen and you're coming from a non-business background, so I have a science background, Bachelor of Science in Bio and Neuropsychology. Yeah. I need a Which four- only helped you with brewing beer. Um, That's brewing it. Brewing beer, talking to people, understanding <laughs> psychology, doing you know, personality assessments, all that stuff. Um, so if you're in that situation when you do need a solid understanding of business fundamentals at large, an MBA is 100% the right choice for you. A lot of people I meet are looking to the MBA as the key to their pivot. Exactly. And that's where I go, no, what's the skill set you're trying to, what's the knowledge you're trying to learn? Because an MBA is not going to, it will give you that 100%, but it's going to give you a fraction of the value long term. So why not do a master's in supply chain, a master's in finance, a master's in HR? There's literally a master's for every single facet of business, all the way down to business analytics. But like there's lots of schools, but it really comes down to if you want to advance your career, what's going to advance it? Uh, and an MBA is typically isn't it? No. Well, for the, again, the 90% of the students that you've just described, yes, it's MBAs are no good. But the thought of like going through that type of learning experience, and I think that's what I was getting to, which mm. is like, I'm happy for that. Okay. Let's go back to you being an entrepreneur. So sure. um, you tried to build the sales organization, failed miserably. I did. Yeah. Right. Although I will say, I got a shout out. <laughs> Um, I have a really family, not unlike here, I've got a very family run company. It's yeah. awesome. I love the fact we're so tight. My VP and my, so her title's changed now. She's an account manager, but they're sisters. So she has taken on the account management role. And within, this is like the sales story that should never be told. Within her first 30 outreaches, she got a contact who was interested. He was at a different company, moved to a new company, called, we just landed that deal last month. Amazing. So not to say my team hasn't shifted it, we're there, yeah. but it's in, a, it's in a different format than what I would have yeah. preferred, yeah. but we're there. Yeah. So it, didn't, it failed in my expectation, successful in, on actual reality of what it should have been. Can I, can I tell you what we've done, and, uh, and, and we've done it, I yeah, think, very yeah, yeah, successfully. Yeah. We put a lot of, I'm pointing off camera to Jadine right now, but like we've done or put a lot of emphasis into relationship management. Mm-hmm. Like instead of salespeople, which the, we have traditionally hired. Mm-hmm. And even when you were here through, you were what, eight, nine years? Uh, eight years? A little over seven, seven, okay. almost seven and a half. Right. There was always the emphasis of hiring that salesperson. Yep. How many salespeople did we hire? <sighs> Tons. Churned. And then me and you, or me, you, and a couple others were the ones that did the sales that technically were not in sales positions, or we were in business development positions, but we were interested, and we put a lot of effort into relationship management. And maybe this is advice, maybe it's a little bit of acknowledgement of what you're saying, but I don't think you need to build a sales culture, you need to build a really strong relationship management culture and if I'll tell you, there's one person that I've learned how to network from, it's you. Ugh. And here's how I tell, when I'm in front of people, here's what I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say, so I'm Greg Witz. I'm a super big extrovert personality. I'll go to a networking event. I'll come out with 300 business cards, not knowing 300 people or not remembering 300 conversations. Mm. And you'll come out of a networking event with like three business cards, mm. with three relationships, and three follow-ups, and not just follow-up from a business standpoint, but like a follow-up, like, hey, really great to meet you. Let's continue the dialogue. So talk yeah. to us about networking. So the networking, how it is important for the success of business, how it's maybe successful for what you're trying to achieve with your sales yeah. culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, relationships, credit networking and relationships with my entire career, starting from how I ended up even here. Right? I mean, we. I met you via one of our mutual contacts, yeah, friends, Yeah, we gave a shout out, Stephen Friedman yeah, from Schulich. Yeah, shout out Stephen. The crazy, so, cra- crazy professor. Crazy who, professor who I was fortunate enough to meet in my early mm-hmm. days. And, you know, he and I bonded over, you know, I always... Over a joint. Uh, no, oddly enough. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> we, we kept it clean. We were student yeah. and teacher. Like, this okay. very professional. But yeah. Not um, that Stephen or Jared smoke weed, either one of Never. Um... No, he and I bonded over a few shared personal facts. Uh, we both come from the tribe. If you're part of it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, we both, he and my brother and, and father both went to the same <laughs> camp, had some of the same similarities in our backgrounds. So we just clicked. Uh, but he's the reason I ended up here. And so that was all through a relationship. And now you fast forward, when I left here, um, you know, it was a tough decision. It was not taken lightly. It was... Like, I cried walking out the door. I know. It was I really know. tough. But so, it was important for you, man. Like, you know, massive. I tell the story of, like, you know, it would have been really 
bad for you to stay at wits. You're you you were meant to pop. You were meant to like move on to the next thing. Like you've got shit to accomplish and do. Well, I have things, and you know, I don't think that it's an exclusivity of wits either. I think there's lots of stuff for us in the future. But what caused me to leave wasn't. Uh, I mean, you and I always talked about you know take mm-hmm. that dream opportunity. Um, it was literally a guy I met my first day of my MBA. Um, those who are seeing me on camera or hearing me talk haven't seen me stand up or me live. I'm really tall, mm-hmm. like six foot eight tall, um, towering. I'm called tree on the ice for a yeah. reason. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really tall. So I met this guy because he and I were both tall guys. We saw each other across a room, literally across the back of an auditorium. We shook hands on that day. We just realized, thanks to Facebook, actually, we've known each other for over a decade now. Wow. We just passed our decade mark. Wow. So he was the one who called me. Did you go out for dinner? Hmm? Did you go for dinner? Uh, we, should. We, we, we reach should. out, reach out. We you should go for week, dinner. We, we, like... we have to do a boys' weekend. Let's oh, okay. Weekend. Yeah, it's yeah. coming we'll, up. We'll celebrate then. That's all right. Uh, we have to keep business and personal separate. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it was literally him who called me. Drugs up and, and inappropriate debauchery behavior needs to be kept separate 100%. from business. <laughs> um, that's why we keep it separate. Uh, but no, but, but he was the one who called me up and said, hey, you know, he and I tried to launch a couple of companies in the past, yeah. nothing really came of it. Um, and this was our chance to go out on a limb and try to work together. And, you know, from our standpoint, it's worked out maybe not the way we want in terms of our business, in terms of um, actual success, in terms of our KPIs and metrics. But in terms of he and I working together, it's been great. I mean, it's really helped us out. But that was the opportunity. He's still with the work. company or he's part of the he's company? He's the owner. He's the owner. Owner. Oh, yeah. He's the guy that bought it. That's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so he bought it and pulled me to go run it for him. Yeah. And so he and I, I have known each other for over a decade. When I left, part of my deal with him was that I was going to have ownership. So that was free, that was on the table from the get go because I wouldn't leave yeah, otherwise. I remember that conversation. As part of that conversation with him, he actually brought up whether or not we wanted to extend that to our two VPs who had been with the company for a number of years each. And I jumped on that and said, absolutely, because it shows our commitment to them. And Does it force them to buy in? Like, do nope. it. Okay, nope. so it's, a, it's gifted. For, for all of us, for the three of us involved, it's being gifted to us to a certain okay. pretend, uh, percentage and then we can buy an additional. Yeah. But what that allows us to do is from day one is that we operate at the same level. Yeah. So it's not you know the owner, then me as his mouthpiece, and then the two, no, 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 no. There's the three of us internally who work cohesively as a team. Do we always see eye to eye? <laughs> Absolutely not. And that's where we get in some really heated conversations, which is great. Um, we're very transparent, we're very blunt, we don't hold our punches. Um, my boss expects the same out of me, and the four of us collectively do the same thing. Um, but it allowed us to all take that approach from the get-go, which if you're going to blend cultures and companies, that C-suite um, acknowledgement of their contribution historically is so vital because that's when you lose your top talent. And that's why so many mergers fall apart. So they don't take into consideration the culture. Yeah, and the people, you guys right? were very lucky. I mean, it wasn't a merger. It was an acquisition. Yeah. I think you guys did it very well. The owner, the original owner was no longer involved, right? So, and a lot of the people that were there before, the, in, the entire much team is still there. All but two, one of whom left a couple of weeks before we took over, yeah. and one who left the, his last week was my first week, which actually worked out really well, incidentally, um, because it meant that at the end of his week, I could take him out for a coffee and be like, dude, give me, give me the, the, the Give ugly. me the deeds. Give me the ugly, and honestly, that conversation put calmed me down so much, excuse me, because he's now moved on. He's worked with a couple different companies, He's dropped by the office regularly. We see him on a regular basis because he loved his time with the company. It's like you. He hears about what I've done now and he's like, shit, that's awesome. Doesn't want to come back because he's doing awesome stuff where he is. Um, but that's the culture we've that was there before. So for me walking into to your point, I'm so lucky, so fortunate that that's the fit. And I mean, you and I talked about this when I was about to leave. That fit was so key. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to leave. The fit wasn't there. Mm-hmm. The fit was there and look at the result. You have you know, ex colleagues who want to keep coming back. Just like me here. I'm here. How often I talk? I mean, I play po- hockey with Macri every Sunday. I've been out to the farm to see Nicole a couple of times. They drop in to chat with you every, you know, every few months. So let's talk about yeah. homeschooling. I was actually at my brother's house yesterday. Mm. His uh, wife is a teacher, mm-hmm. and we were talking about the difference between public school, private school, also Montessori. Yeah. And I then brought up homeschooling, and I actually said, hey. I used to work with this guy, Jared, hmm. who I happen to know who today is this dude, but had experience with homeschooling. And I'm not yeah. suggesting that, I wasn't suggesting that my wife or I are even capable of homeschooling, but talk to us about the different school systems, public, private, home, and you didn't do Montessori. I didn't do Montessori, although we've already enrolled my, my one-year-old Amazing. daughter into Montessori. Amazing. Yeah. Most uh, important thing you could have done. 
I completely agree, truthfully. Having looked at what the daycare situation is like there and not being able to be there myself in person to do the homeschooling type of thing um, is definitely the best option. But yeah, so I mean, I was homeschooled. I'm the oldest of four. All of us were homeschooled for various durations of our elementary years. Um, And I was homeschooled initially because my parents were looking for a level of education that wasn't really offered um, within the public system and they didn't have my understanding I could be wrong but my understanding is they didn't have the funds available to them at that time being they had my younger brother on the way and I think my younger sister was all on her way um, to be able to put one of us into private school so they said you know what for the cost of putting all these kids into daycare we can teach them all at home and my mother to her credit highly values education although she's not a university graduate herself she might as well be she's one of the most educated and well-read people i know um so she taught us all Mm -hmm. and so what did that allow us to do um that helped me now and where i'm at we had a soft curriculum where the mornings were always dedicated to math and reading and writing so Mm -hmm. i'm um, i'm a ghostwriter i Mm -hmm. do copy for my agency still um pure skills that i got from my mom no other piece of education along the way has helped my writing solely attributed to her um and if you can write and you can do basic math you can do literally anything i went to high school doing almost university level math and english but was behind in science and history because you don't have the same abilities when you don't have a lab or that type of environment um but i ended up majoring in sciences okay. so, so a big deal so homeschooling versus public Sorry, school right. no no this. no tell me the yeah, difference yeah, yeah. like how long were you homeschooled and what years were you in public school for okay so i was in a private jewish private school until i was in senior kindergarten okay I went, so I was toddler home. yep so I, was, under f- I was homeschooled until I, I went into a single year of private school in grade five okay then I went and did a September to December in public school in grade seven. Okay. Hated it. Okay. Dropped why? Dropped the hell out of um, My biggest, there's a few frustrations I had, and it was right. purely my decision, not my parents. Yeah, yeah. Um, they put me in at my request and pulled me out at my request. I went in because I thought there was a better schooling than my mother. Yeah. I was wrong. Okay. Um, I want more social. Didn't need it. Yeah. The reason I dropped out of the school was mostly due to pace. I wanted things to advance faster. I wanted to be yeah. challenged more aggressively. See, that's that's uh, that's a Montessori environment now, or a homeschooling 100%. environment, right? Yeah. Which is like you adapt the learning for the kid. Well, and more so even with homeschooling. So I had this very structured morning to my to my yeah. days, where it was purely academic. My afternoons were open for me to do whatever I wanted, which could be me playing with my brother in the backyard, pretending to have sword fights with sticks, which some people might say is a waste of time, no, and I would argue important. to say not even remotely. Um, but on some of those afternoons, I would pick up a book on pick your topic and I would read it covered as an avid reader as a kid. I'm getting back into that now more in audiobooks because I drive so much for my job yeah. um, and the commute. Um, but I would devour books. So the benefit was whatever topic I happened to be interested in that time, I could go deep and quickly. I mean, kids now have such an advantage having internet. I mean, mm. I had to wait for my parents to be able to take me to the library to get a book out on whatever the topic was I cared about. Whereas now I can Google that and have not just a surface level, I can get the top expert in the world's paper on that topic in front of me in the snap of her fingers. For sure. So the advantage the, of homeschooling. The, the ability to learn today and the ability to consume oh, information is insane. Massive. Right? And that's, I think, the biggest advantage of homeschooling over the public school if you're um i have to be a little careful here because i think public system is as can be as good as homeschooling or a private system if you are a hyper engaged parent and i say that being a very new parent with a Mm one-year-old i understand it gets a lot more challenging um but i draw that exclusively from the fact that i had two parents who taught not Mm. just one but four of us the foundation of everything we know so it's doable um, but the biggest thing is that when you're homeschooled without that root structure around you, you're free to explore. Whereas within the public system, they try to force you into the avenues to explore without that same freedom, which is where programs like Montessori or a Waldorf system are a lot more flexible and definitely set your brain more to a way of thinking of how do I find this information versus a I can either get it or not. So I think it helps you think outside the box a bit more. For sure. Uh, okay. 
So I think looking at the clock, we're sort of coming to that time right now. So unless there's like <laughs> anything, my one year old to bed, I right? Any, yeah. Anything else to major? But listen, Jared, thank you. Re- I appreciate hanging with you today. Oh, anytime, man. Really I appreciate you coming to talk again. I think the the what some of you don't get to see is the relationship that you and I have had for now. What coming close to ten years? Uh, I think we're at the end of this. Come. What would it be? I think it's March 2020. It'll be a decade, my man. There you go. Yeah. Decade. Decade Crazy, of a relationship. Right? And like you're fucking rocking your company now. You're fucking running your own show. Thank you for coming to talk. Uh, that's our show for today. Don't forget to leave your uh, comments, like, subscribe, ring that bell. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Peace. Yeah, peace out, buddy. Thank you. Really appreciate Cheers. it.